Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner. As part of our Mind Body Connection series, we'll continue to look more deeply at the three columns and their corresponding action steps. Today, we will consider what is actually happening in the body in a mind body process and why all of the individual theories only show a part of the puzzle. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below and I'll get back to you personally. When I first discovered Sarno, I was so relieved to feel that most things were actually finally making sense. After eight years of wandering around in the desert of lack of information, I was finally getting information that did make sense to me. Mind-body experience was actually the human condition. The pain being that bad from mind-body uh, experience was actually very typical. The mind-body experience also, uh, the process, was quite evident in things like blushing, goosebumps, salivation, uh, you know, when food is around, etc. All of these things, crying. These were all examples that came up as I wrote my book and as I read Sarno. All of these things just kept converging on things that made sense. On top of it, Sarno described the personality of the goodest and... I was very, very struck by this. There was a particular thing that I've mentioned at various points, but I used to smile when I was saying things that were actually bad for me, and I didn't really understand why, but when it was described in Sarno's books, that was further confirmation. It felt like this guy was describing me at a whole new level that I never even imagined was a category. Realizing there were other people like me having these experiences really started to get things into shape. So I'm so incredibly grateful to Dr. Sarno for his incredible contributions to helping so many of us get pain relief, myself included, and sometimes just completely from his books. Other people went to his lectures or interacted with him directly. I got most of, well, I actually did speak to him once, but I did get, that uh, was only for about two minutes, and even that was helpful. But I got most of my relief from his books. But I did want to say something about it that's important, and that is, it was very helpful to me to know that there were some medical doctors that were explaining this. If it had just come from a psychologist like myself, I can understand the skepticism. It's very nice to have medical doctors involved. I think we're at a different point now where psychologists can comment on this some if they have the expertise, if they've done the research, if they've talked to doctors like Howard Schubiner or Dave Clark or David Schechter or David Hanscom, lots of Davids or Elisa Batson. These are big MDs in the field who know and have followed up on, on what Sarno um, began, and they can continue weighing in with the medical side of the picture, and it is very reassuring. So that was another reason, all of these things, that really told me Sarno was right. It was all fitting together, except a couple areas. And these couple areas were very, very important. So one of the areas I had some major questions about after reading Sarno that I felt needed to be answered was what was happening in the physiology, in the mind-body process. After all, Sarno himself said, we need to believe the diagnosis fully to get better. So I figured, well, why not make it really fully? I couldn't accept the parts that didn't all add up. One of the main things I did not understand in Sarno's work, and I'm not saying this is a criticism of him, but just to tell you about what, how my thinking evolved and why I think about it a little bit differently than he did, uh, was his explanation of the physiology of the experience. To me, that it, it left something to be desired in terms of logic. It just didn't all add up, and I'll tell you why. The weight that was given to oxygen deprivation seemed way out of whack because I couldn't understand why why did the mind-body setup rely so heavily on that one system. It just didn't make entire sense to me. On top of that, it didn't explain so many of the symptoms people were having, or even the general mind-body experience. Blushing was all about changes in blood flow, not about oxygen deprivation. So I didn't know why we were honing in on this so much. So the fact that it was oxygen deprivation was not explaining too many different aspects meant there had to be better answers. Now, Sarno was initially just dealing with back pain, and then he was dealing with musculoskeletal pain. So, you know, he was working it through, and he did a great job. 
but there are things that we can extend now that we know so much more. So here are some of the questions that I had as I was at that stage. I was thinking about other issues, you know, issues besides musculoskeletal. How do we explain the mind-body process? How? How does it make us cry when we're sad? What, what is that? What's the actual physiological experience or, or happening? So I was thinking, how can I rely on a theory that only partially explained these things? I was thinking, why had the body chosen such emphasis on oxygen only? And why was it able to titrate that experience in such a pinpointed way when other s- systems weren't also doing such things? It just, it just didn't make sense to me. So I was thinking, why would we be okay endorsing a view? Uh, this, is just, uh, this is another major point that got you know, my logic going in the direction of what I needed to know. Why would we be okay endorsing a view that tension headaches could come from stress, but not shoulder, back, elbow, or knee pain? Now, Sarno agrees with me on that point. That wasn't a point that I was finding variation with him, but all of the logic rolled into one as I thought about what is society saying about this? What is Sarno saying about it? What actually makes sense? Sarno made sense of a lot of things, but what he was saying about oxygen deprivation didn't feel right to me, not because I believe that oxygen deprivation isn't part of the process, because I think it is. It's just that it's one part of the process. So my main answers were coming from Sarno. What I did is I looked kind of deeper within Sarno to see, is there something in here that I missed? And I found this one paragraph in The Divided Mind, which ended up being very important. It easily could have been missed, so that's part of why I'm trying to highlight it. And it it was mentioned kind of almost in passing. Uh, He probably did this in the interest of time and writing space, because when you're, you know, writing a book, as I'm still doing, you know you've got to pick what you're going to put in there. And, uh, He may have felt he didn't have enough time for it, or it may be that he didn't just didn't understand it well enough. So this passage referred to Candace Pert's Molecules of Emotion. It is a wonderful book if you feel that you have doubt about what is happening in the mind and the body. When I read Candace Pert, that's when it clicked more for me what was happening in the physiology of the mind-body experience. Because her explanation explained why everything in mind-body living was possible. It covered the whole ground, oxygen deprivation and all. To me, oxygen deprivation always struck me as one of thousands of things that could happen. I didn't doubt that Sarno was right about it, but it it didn't explain everything else, so it couldn't be the overall answer. And the way I was thinking about it logically is that there had to be an underlying mechanism even to the pinpoint control of the oxygen deprivation. What was that? It's Candace Pert that provided that for me. Later on, as I reprocessed this, I also thought through the neural pathway argument. Um, the neural pathway argument also makes sense of parts of the process, but it doesn't make sense of all of it either. As an example, if neural pathways become so grooved and hard to change, how is it that so many people were getting better pretty instantly from a book cure? Now, I know some people are not, but some people are, and that means it is possible. And that means neural pathways being really grooved is not likely to be the answer. So again, this theory gave a partial answer that runs counter to some of our lived experience. Even aha moments in therapy, they belie the idea of groove neural pathways being hard to change because you have a great session and you realize something. A lot of times you never go back. You never think the same way. So what it's, what it's suggesting to me is neural pathways are real, but we shouldn't look at them as a deterrent or a Uh, a sign that it's going to take a long time to change because they change quickly all the time with the right information. So just because we have, we've had trouble changing it, it doesn't mean that the brain is as slow as we are at it. You know, our personalities working through things are going to be slower than our brain is necessarily capable of carrying things out at that speed. So Candace Pert's explanation is something uh, called peptides. I don't want to dive too much into the jargon of it because uh, things can get lost in translation that way, but I do need to explain a little bit about what they are. So many of you will know what neurotransmitters are. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that communicate between each brain cell. One brain cell tells the next, you need to do this by sending dopamine or serotonin. These are neurotransmitters. 
but they communicate directly in the brain and they only go over this very, very minuscule space called a synapse. But a peptide can do the same thing as a neurotransmitter, but it can travel in the bloodstream and it can go straight from the brain to any cell in your body and command it to do whatever it wants. That made sense to me because it was the global system that now made sense. And this is really how I work with the three column system in general. I needed to see the broad picture. I needed to understand how does this all fit together. Peptides were the key for that. So I was reading that and thinking, aha, now I could see what was the underpinning of oxygen deprivation, the underpinning of the neural pathway argument, the underpinning of blushing, of crying, of goosebumps, and all other psychosomatic experiences. Remember, when I say psychosomatic, it's from the head, but it's realized in the body, very real. So there is a philosophical proposition. It's called Occam's Razor. Also, I'm not going to dive deep into philosophy here, but I do need you to know the basics of this. Occam's Razor says the less assumptions that are required for a given theory, the more likely it is to be true. If you've got all these complicated assumptions, it becomes unlikely that it's true. Well, the peptide theory, it had basically one assumption. Uh, One assumption that could explain why all these things were happening. Theories should should not be instantly disproven by obvious data. That, that's a bad theory. And we had a lot of obvious data that was saying couldn't be just oxygen deprivation. We have a lot of obvious data saying neural pathways don't get stuck so much of the time. That must not be the explanation. Then, Even the act of smiling, it happens when you're having an emotion. You, you don't think I'm going to smile now or moving your arm. It's a mind-body process. So it's absurd that we even question the mind-body process at all because it's literally everywhere at every moment. But in the peptide theory, we now have one assumption only. And that assumption is peptides do what we think they do, (laughs) meaning they can be the messengers between the mind and the body. This is how we can explain what is happening. It's one assumption. And it's not even a total assumption because we have some of the science to show that peptides do exist. We know that they can travel in the bloodstream. And um, we do know something about their function. We don't necessarily know for sure that they can do all of these things. But because they are the, the, uh, the command functions of the brain and what it gives to the body, the only thing we have to assume is it can do all of these things. So if we assume that, now we would know the brain can control every single physical process. And it fit with my own observations. So that was the starting point. As I explored this, I found this to be more and more true. And the logic points to it too, not just the science. Let's briefly, though, talk about what peptides can do. The answer, everything. (laughs) Changes in oxygen levels, check. Changes in blood flow, check. Changes in nerves firing, check. Changes in digestion, changes in water flow. Making sounds in the fluids between joints. I get questions about that a lot. Sounds do not mean it is not a mind-body thing at all. That's just another thing that can be mind-body. Making pain persist beyond healing, check. Causing inflammation, check. From musculoskeletal pain to digestive issues, to circulatory issues, to rashes, hives, and other skin disorders, to sleep struggles, to anxiety and depression, we now had access to one central, clear, universal, and completely consistent explanation for how the mind controls the body at will. To me, that was a great relief. I needed to have that because the other theories, they really felt like they had major holes, and they do. So they have parts that are correct, but... We are needlessly confused by these. Um, You know, if you don't recognize the broader picture and you're ignoring certain pieces of information, then these theories, even if they're 80% correct, they're not useful enough. The analogy that I often give to people is when they were discovering the orbits of the planets, they thought that once they figured out that the sun was not revolving around the earth, they thought there were circular orbits they got the alignment of the stars and planets right about 80% of the time. That means it's incorrect. When Kepler came in and said they're elliptical orbits, it became right 100% of the time. 
finally it was right. Same thing with peptide theory. It gets it all right because it has the broader structure. So using this logic, I came to my central rule of thumb. If the body has the capacity to do it for physical reasons, these same systems, all of them, can be utilized for psychological ones. In other words, if the body can do it, TMS can use it. Now again, TMS is a term that not universally used. It's tension myositis syndrome. That's what Sarno called uh, initially the pain that people got in muscles, but it got extended to everything else. Same thing as PPD, mind-body syndrome, mind-body issues, whatever we're going to call it. If the body can do it, the process can use it. My hope is that by having this part of your doubt settled, you will do so much better getting better, as was the case with me. And that's why I shared this with you. So let me know what you think. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I'll get back to you personally.